Thank you so much, Blair. And thank you all for being here on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this is really remarkable that uh, you all are here. And I'm, uh, of course, uh, honored and humbled to serve part-time on uh, your faculty. Uh, thrilled to see uh, Dean Graham here and uh, Professor Warnkin, uh, uh, my uh, leader in the planning program, and uh, legendary uh, Professor Goins, and uh, uh, Mayor and Mrs. Uh, Humphreys, uh, uh, and some of my former students who may uh, decided to spend a, an extra hour with me. I'm uh, really happy to see you all. Uh, and uh, I'm, um, I'm happy to talk with you about uh, a subject that I think relates very closely uh, to the mission of the Institute for Quality Communities. Uh, I think uh, President Warren has again provided uh, exemplary leadership in funding uh, this initiative. It's really something uh, much uh, uh, needed uh, in Oklahoma to, to support the, the growth and development of the uh, communities of different sizes uh, across the state. I, I really commend uh, President Warren for, uh, for that vision uh, and for hiring uh, somebody uh, of the caliber of Blair Humphreys to, to lead it. Uh, and, uh, and Ron France uh, who recently joined the, the Institute. Uh, what a powerful team. Uh, Oklahoma is really uh, on the leading edge of, uh, of thinking and, and action uh, about the, uh, the development cities of uh, Mayor Humphreys. We often use Oklahoma City as an example of how to do things. And as you noted, uh, the community's come a long way uh, in Oklahoma City over the last 15 years or so. And I think uh, the prospects of the future are, are really uh, very positive. I'm uh, uh, happy to tell you a little bit uh, today about uh, Fort Worth and the work that we've done uh, done to revitalize our distressed uh, commercial districts. Uh, a big challenge in any community, but I think the, the principles that I can uh, describe to you this afternoon are, are equally applicable in, uh, in a small town uh, with, a, with a struggling downtown uh, or in a mid or larger, uh, mid size or larger city uh, in which uh, the decline of commercial districts is uh, all too uh, commonplace. And uh, uh, there are examples around the country, uh, and I think this is one that I think uh, uh, you might want to uh, consider. Uh, so let me let me start by uh, telling you a little bit about uh, Fort Worth. I think most of you are familiar with it. Let me, should I catch some lights to provide a little bit better contrast? Sure. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Let me give it a try. Share some uh, some images with you. This is a a, a, a photo of downtown Fort Worth, uh, uh, actually the, the very heart of downtown, Sundance Square, uh, which was uh, <clears throat> a development project led by the Bass family starting all oh, about 30 years ago now. And if you visit Fort Worth today, and I, I bet uh, most of the folks in the room have. Uh, you know that our downtown is thriving. It's it's alive uh, well into the night uh, with a, a, a mix of residential and commercial uses of, of different kinds. This picture was taken on the Saturday evening uh, immediately preceding uh, uh, this year's Super Bowl game uh, between the, uh, the Packers and Steelers. The Steelers were uh, headquartered in Fort Worth. The Packers in uh, uh, in, uh, in Irving, uh, and yet all the Packers fans joined all the Steelers fans in Sundance Square on the night before the big game. Why? Because there is a sense of place there. This is a, a, a magnet for people. It's not that they had a particular destination in mind. They wanted a gathering place where they could interact with lots of other people of different kinds, from different backgrounds, and they found it here. And in fact, uh, this event, uh, in connection with the Super Bowl, helped a lot of our own folks in Fort Worth to appreciate 
the value of placemaking. We've talked about it a lot, but they didn't appreciate it uh, until uh, they experienced uh, a large crowd in this space uh, in front of the uh, ESPN uh, studio. Uh, that was a big deal. In fact, um, not unlike a story that I was uh, sharing with Blair uh, earlier today about the Olympic Games uh, and how a group from Atlanta had visited Barcelona uh, in connection with the 1992 Games, four years before we were going to host it in Atlanta. And our civic leaders from Atlanta came away dazzled by the vitality of the street life in Barcelona and the, the magnificent public spaces and the architecture there. And they came back uh, to the state saying, we've got to do that in Atlanta. We need more placemaking. We need to improve our streetscapes. We need to improve our parks and our plazas. We need to improve the relationship between the buildings and the streets. In fact, we've been preaching those very things for years, but it took that firsthand experience by our decision makers uh, fully for them to understand uh, the importance of placemaking. The same is true here. Uh, and so I recall some of the most influential community leaders talking about placemaking, sense of place, terms that we as planners and architects often use. Uh, it's becoming uh, more commonplace in Fort Worth. So this is a, a great place in, in Fort Worth, uh, a place that we all uh, recognize and for which uh, many of us have uh, a great deal of affection. Uh, the cultural district in Fort Worth, I, I think uh, many of you, um, uh, Mr. Young and I were just talking about uh, 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 the Kimball, uh, which is uh, depicted on the left side of the screen, the, the Kimball Art Museum uh, designed by Louis Kahn. It's being expanded now, uh, something that many folks didn't think would happen because it's such a marvelous building in its own right. Uh, but a former disciple of Louis Kahn, uh, uh, Renzo Piano, uh, is the architect uh, for the expansion. Uh, on what was formerly the, uh, the Great Lawn uh, uh, between the, the Kimball and the M. Carter Museum, which uh, was designed by, by Philip Johnson, <coughs> another uh, notable uh, architect from the 20th century. Uh, the the, the, uh, the M. Carter Museum is, uh, is uh, just this year celebrating its 50th anniversary. It was uh, opened in 1961. And, and the newest addition uh, uh, to this uh, 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 trio is the, the Modern Art Museum. Tadao Ando from uh, Japan uh, is a designer. Three magnificent uh, pieces of architecture in our cultural district, uh, three great uh, uh, collections of art, all of which work together to create a different but also impressive sense of place uh, for the west side of Fort Worth. Uh, and, um, and Mr. Beck, uh, Professor Beck, was just uh, telling me about his visit to the Fort Worth Stockyards uh, last weekend and, and what a marvelous place we have there, uh, which uh, perhaps as much as any other place in Fort Worth uh, truly celebrates our, our Western heritage. Uh, and it's authentic. Uh, there's nothing uh, art artificial about it. It's, 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 it's the genuine article. Uh, and you can come in and, uh, like all these other folks that have done in this image, and and feel right at home uh, in, in the Fort Worth uh, uh, that, that, that we've, we've always known. Uh, uh, capturing that that's, uh, authenticity, uh, that sense of place is, is important to, to the creation of a, of a vital community. And that's uh, especially important in, in a place like Fort Worth that's growing as rapidly as we are. Uh, this uh, uh, chart shows you our population growth uh, since uh, the mid 20th century. And today we're at about 750,000. If we continue growing at, at, at the current rate, we'll uh, uh, very likely exceed a, a million population uh, in the next uh, uh, 20 years or so. Uh, we have been uh, the fastest growing large city in the United States uh, over the last decade uh, and are now the 16th largest city in the country. We don't, we don't feel like a big city in every respect, uh, but we are and, and we have a lot of big city issues uh, to, to address. One of which uh, is the relative, relatively slow growth of the central city inside Loop 820 and the very rapid growth of the uh, peripheral uh, sections of the city, far north, far northwest, uh, far south. Uh, suburban sprawl, if you will. What can we do to bring more life, uh, more jobs, uh, more residents, to the central city of Fort Worth. That's a challenge. That's a challenge um, 
that uh, uh, Mayor Barr, uh, uh, when he brought me to Fort Worth, asked me to address along with the city council. They said, we want you, among other things, not just to control the rapid growth uh, on the periphery of the city and, and associate our infrastructure decisions with our land use decisions, but what can you do to help us revitalize our central city? Uh, make it uh, uh, the, the kind of place that will bring uh, folks not just to downtown, but to other parts of Fort Worth uh, for business, uh, for recreation, for, uh, for living. And so our, uh, we turned our attention uh, to these uh, distressed, in some cases downright blighted, commercial districts that typically uh, took a linear form. Uh, we call them uh, commercial quarters. We actually uh, identified 31 of these commercial quarters within the central city all a mile or more in length, uh, characterized by commercial or industrial zoning uh, along a designated arterial street. That's how we define these 31 uh, commercial quarters. And virtually all of them were declining economically uh, and in physical appearance. Uh, what could we do to reverse that long-standing pattern? That was, that was our challenge. This is what these commercial corridors uh, typically look like. If you've been in uh, one of my classes, you've probably seen this image before. And I, I often uh, ask folks uh, if they can identify this place. I've asked uh, commercial uh, realtors in Fort Worth, can you tell me where this place is? And, and immediately, a dozen hands go up. Everybody says, I know exactly where that is. That's Belknap Street. No, no, that's East Lancaster Street. No, that's East Rosedale. And they argue about it. And then I tell them, I tell them this is not a place. This is a fabricated image. Uh, it's, it's, it's produced by a graphic designer from California. And it's applicable to any city in the United States. You recognize this place because you've been there many times. <laughs> And yet it's, it's not a place at all. In fact, it's, it's a perfect example of what some people call placelessness. There's nothing there. And yet, this is what our cities look like. Nobody wants to live in a place like this. Nobody wants to work there. Nobody who wants to abide by the law has any reason to go there. So what can we do to turn this place or non-place into a place that we want to enjoy? Well, there's a lot of study being done around the country, and, and one of the folks I think some of you are familiar with him, uh, uh, Ed McMahon, uh, not Johnny Carson's sidekick, but the Ed McMahon from uh, the Urban Land Institute, uh, has done a lot of good thinking about how we revitalize the commercial districts. And, uh, some of you may have, may have seen um, uh, his work. This is a quote uh, that I liked, um, and I asked Ed if I could use it, and he, he, he wanted me to, 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 to share it with you. It says, the future belongs to town centers, main streets, and mixed-use development. He says that, that there is no future for the commercial strip, that the commercial strips are going to continue going downhill, that we need to focus on a different form of development, not commercial strips, but town centers, main streets, and mixed use. So those commercial corridors really have no future in that form. In fact, that's what I told the folks in Fort Worth uh, years ago when we started working uh, on, on, on this challenge. Folks wanted us simply to try to replicate the past, and, and, and my response was, that's not going to work. We need a, a new model, uh, which in, a, in effect is an old model, if you go back far enough to the uh, era before uh, the automobile became so dominant in our culture. It's the old model of mixing uses and, and walking from place to place. How much of that can we capture while still accommodating automobile use, which I, th I think is going to remain a, a mainstay uh, in our society? That's the challenge. Uh, and, and what can we learn uh, from, uh, from this observation? Mr. McMahon says that there are five reasons uh, why uh, commercial strips are going downhill. We're overbuilt on the strip. We have far too much commercial space, and that's why you see so many vacant uh, big box real, uh, retailers and, and other businesses along the commercial quarters. 
Retail is actually moving back to the city. Retailers want to be in the center of the action. Uh, many of the, of the malls from the 60s and 70s are, are now closing or, or de deciding that they need to reinvent themselves. Traffic congestion, fuel prices and design are all problems for the Strip. And they're all advantages for downtowns and uh, mixed-use districts uh, that can compete successfully with the uh, commercial strips. The economy is restructuring uh, the retail landscape. And e-commerce means that we have less of a need uh, for, uh, for retail stores. The demand is for fewer and smaller stores uh, to locate on these commercial strips. So economic and, and social trends are shifting in favor of uh, mixed-use development. That's a national trend. And so we want to take this image of the commercial strip and make appropriate changes in respect to design and marketing to turn it into this image, uh, which obviously emphasizes uh, a, a mix of uses, greater density, uh, and more emphasis on, on other modes of transportation but besides the automobile. We can still accommodate cars, but we've got many pedestrians, uh, cyclists, access by public transportation. Uh, these are three elements, mixed use, density, uh, and, and, and transit, that often cut against the grain of our thinking uh, in American culture. Uh, they require planners, uh, among others, to educate our decision makers uh, and to change the way uh, they have a proclivity to think about these things. Mixing residential and commercial uses is not a bad thing. It's not a dangerous thing. Density is not a bad thing. It, 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 it does not equate uh, with uh, criminal activity, not if you design uh, density appropriately. And, and public transportation can be a, a legitimate choice for us to make, uh, not a last resort for folks who, who simply can't afford to drive their own cars. So if you combine those three elements in a place uh, like this, uh, you can be uh, successful. But it takes a big educational effort uh, to move decision makers and, and, uh, and ordinary citizens away from the, uh, the way of thinking that we've been accustomed uh, to, to, to adopting. And so we set about a public process involving many community leaders to designate a, a total of 16 urban villages uh, depicted conceptually uh, on this diagram in different parts of Fort Worth Central City. Uh, uh, we only wanted to, to go where the community uh, would support mixed-use development. Uh, they would only support mixed-use development if they were educated about it. So we spent a lot of time going around the community and, and in fact holding conferences in which, to which we invited uh, experts from around the country uh, to provide us uh, with their own perspectives on sustainable development of different forms and, and how mixed-use development can lead us in a better direction. And so it takes time. It takes time, but it's time well spent to educate the community about the value of, of, of different uh, uh, development forms. And once those uh, ordinary citizens and community leaders are educated, the elected officials will follow suit. Uh, and I've learned that you don't start with the elected officials uh, in the educational process. You start with the community. Uh, and if you educate the community, uh, the rest will take care of itself. And that's exactly what we did. So we designated these urban villages and set upon uh, uh, the process of, of revitalizing them. We adopted a three-part strategy to, uh, to develop these urban villages. Uh, and, they're, uh, and the three parts are capital improvements, economic incentives, and, and mixed-use zoning. Uh, all three important. Uh, to creating a level playing field so that redeveloping property in the central city would be uh, just as appealing uh, to a developer or an investor as would be a project in the greenfield on the, on the perimeter uh, of the city. I don't want to go uh, too far into the weeds on the details of these uh, approaches, but let me say just a, a few words about it uh, for those who are interested. Uh, capital improvements, it, it's all about uh, developing uh, discipline uh, among elected officials about targeting uh, uh, these uh, uh, development uh, districts in the allocation of discretionary capital funds. 
And so for the last 10 years or so, whenever funding opportunities have become available that would be uh, suitable for, for mixed-use districts, that's exactly where the city council has put our money. Now, any, anyone who's been involved in politics knows how difficult it is to maintain that kind of discipline over any period of time. But the forward city council has actually done so on, on our advice, and that's made a big difference. These are some, just some examples of over $40 million of, uh, of funds of, of a discretionary nature that have gone into uh, pedestrian improvements uh, and other projects in our urban villages. In respect to development incentives, we've used a tool uh, which in, in Texas is called Neighborhood Empowerment Zones. It's, it's uh, uh, something that's uh, permitted under Texas uh, state law. Uh, it's a delineation of, 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 a, of a district, a, a, a zone within which uh, we can provide extraordinary incentives uh, to uh, revitalize uh, uh, those districts. So, and uh, among those incentives, uh, we have uh, uh, waivers of, of development fees. Uh, we have uh, sales tax uh, refunds or, or abatement of sales tax. Uh, municipal property tax abatement, that's a big deal uh, in, uh, in Fort Worth. Uh, grants and loans, uh, public improvements, and, and land assembly. We can do a variety of things to provide special treatment for these designated urban villages that we don't uh, do uh, for other parts of Fort Worth. And we've designated these neighborhood power zones uh, throughout the central city, uh, generally in close connection to the designated urban villages. We have other tools, and they're, uh, they're not uncommon. Uh, many of you have, uh, have worked uh, with these tools in the past. Tax increment finance districts, uh, where we capture uh, tax revenues from uh, increased property values to fund the public improvements that, that make those uh, 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 property value increase as possible. Uh, we have uh, 11 tax increment finance districts uh, in Fort Worth and, uh, and several of them are associated with our urban villages. Uh, you can see five of them uh, are located uh, uh, in our urban villages uh, and the TIF districts have made a big difference uh, in certain cases uh, with the success of, of that development. Uh, a good example uh, is our south side uh, uh, tax increment finance district. Uh, this is the near south side, uh, commonly called the medical district, uh, just across I-30 from downtown uh, Fort Worth. Uh, uh, that TIF district is staffed by a nonprofit organization called Fort Worth South, and we work very closely with them. And they've used uh, the incremental tax revenues to fund streetscape improvements, what we call complete streets. Those are streets that are designed to accommodate not just automobiles, but also pedestrians, cyclists, and other transportation modes. They built a parking garage uh, in, in the heart of the district, uh, and they promoted different forms of residential and, and mixed-use development. This is just a street scene from uh, Magnolia Avenue, which is a, uh, a, a very lively place. And, and if you ever have a chance to, to visit uh, the near south side, uh, particularly uh, during the spring or, 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 or in the fall when they have uh, what they call the arts goggle, it's, a, it's an arts festival. It, it brings uh, thousands of people uh, to these streets, and it's a, it's a wonderful experience. We also have uh, seven public improvement districts. I think in Oklahoma they're called uh, bids or business improvement districts. I think it's essentially the same thing, where property owners agree to tax themselves, and they control the tax revenues uh, to invest in, in the districts from which those revenues are, are raised. And uh, we've got uh, seven of them, uh, PIDs in, in Fort Worth. and. Uh, uh, two of them uh, are uh, located in urban villages, uh, uh, West 7th and, and Ridgely. And the public improvement districts have also been an, a valuable tool in respect to incentives for the development of these mixed-use districts. Uh, here's a, uh, an image of the Camp Bowie district. Uh, uh, they've contributed funding for a streetscape grant. Uh, they've worked with us uh, in preparing a form-based code. We actually have a form-based code for Camp Bowie uh, Boulevard, we have a form-based code for the near south side. By form-based code, uh, we mean a form of zoning that puts more emphasis on uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, urban form and on uh, the design of buildings and on the use uh, of property. Uh, because we want to design buildings uh, that uh, 
uh, may be used for multiple purposes uh, during the lifetime of that building. So the emphasis is on, is on mixed use and on regulating building form uh, more than on regulating uh, land use. And this is a trend that's becoming more and more popular around the country. Uh, we've done it in, uh, in Fort Worth, uh, in the near south side and on Camp Bowie. And we, we may be doing it in other parts of, of the city as well as this idea uh, takes hold. We actually have a third district. Uh, it's not uh, formally a, an urban village, but it's a, the Trinity Uptown District where we have a very ambitious uh, flood control project called the Trinity River Vision that has the potential to redevelop uh, the near north side of Fort Worth and, and double the size of our downtown. And that's also a form-based code uh, that regulates development in this uh, uh, Trinity Uptown District. So form-based uh, codes, I think, are, uh, would be a, 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 a topic that many of you uh, will want to explore. The third uh, component of our strategy is, is zoning for mixed use. We found that our own worst enemy uh, in respect to revitalizing our commercial districts was ourselves in our zoning regulations. More often than not, zoning served as an impediment to desirable development rather than a facilitator of desirable development. And so we had to revamp our zoning ordinance and get away from zoning restrictions that prevented us from mixing uses, get away from restrictions that required excessive amounts of off-street parking and require that parking to be located in the front yard, separating buildings from the street. That made no sense. Economically, socially, uh, from an environmental standpoint, it made no sense. And yet that's what our zoning regulations required. They prohibited the kinds of densities that would make these districts economically uh, feasible. Uh, so it worked against us. Uh, and everything was oriented around the automobiles. We had to change that, uh, that whole uh, line of thinking. So we created new zoning categories. We called them ME1 and ME2. ME1, lower density, neighborhood-oriented commercial districts, mixed-use districts. ME2, higher density, typically for, for obsolete industrial districts that were suitable for large-scale redevelopment. So depending on the scale of the development, we either rezone the property to ME1 or to ME2 within these designated urban villages. And so we've designated uh, mixed-use zoning districts uh, uh, throughout the central city of Fort Worth, uh, generally speaking, in and around the designated urban villages. And the results, uh, I think we can begin to, to measure them, uh, even though the urban village program is still relatively young. Uh, investment uh, over a billion dollars in the 16 villages, uh, most prominently on West 7th and Magnolia. I've um, shown you some images of those districts. I'll show you some more. Uh, Barry University at the doorstep of TCU. And, uh, and to show that this model can work in a low-income neighborhood, not just in neighborhoods that are prosperous, uh, Polytechnic Wesleyan, uh, which is on the, at the front door of Texas Wesleyan University. That's also been a success. Uh, 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 lower uh, scale investment, but, but still an appreciable impact on that community. That's had an effect on property values. Uh, big increases on the whole, about a 36% increase in property values in the 16 designated urban villages. Uh, that's cash revenue for uh, the city government that we can use to provide uh, uh, better public services. Uh, this has a, a, an appreciable economic impact. Let me close by uh, showing you some images of these uh, urban villages, um, and then if, if any time uh, remains, I'd be happy to, to take questions of, of, from the audience. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Bob, you're uh, uh, remarking early today about the Montgomery Ward uh, uh, building in, uh, in Fort Worth. This is a, a former uh, uh, retail building uh, built way back in the 30s that had become obsolete. Magnificent building, but nobody could figure out a way to reuse it. It was actually a candidate uh, for demolition, which would have been an extraordinary loss uh, for Fort Worth. And, uh, and just in time, we were able to save the building. Uh, the, the, the key was to build this archway uh, that provided uh, pedestrian access through the building. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we now have retail uses uh, at the street level. Uh, I think you had dinner there uh, not too long ago. Uh, it's a magnificent place to visit, and it's, it's, it's busy uh, every night of the week uh, with the condominiums uh, above. Uh, it's been, a, on the whole, a, a big success story. In the back, we actually have a, 
a target, a super target uh, a grocery store and a bunch of other retailers. And you can get access to it through the archway or through other uh, access points. So, uh, and, and as a whole, the, the project has, has really helped people to understand how mixed-use development uh, can succeed uh, in, the, in the central city. This is another example. The project is called South of Seventh. It's right across the street, right across West Seventh Street from uh, the uh, Montgomery Plaza project. Uh, and we here we have uh, uh, housing uh, for uh, uh, for senior citizens. Uh, we have uh, some elegant uh, uh, townhouses, a, a hotel, uh, a commercial. In fact, uh, if we have any uh, problem at all, it's we have too many people visiting uh, this mixed-use district. Uh, uh, we have parking problems because uh, we have more people uh, visiting than we can accommodate. That's a good problem to have, uh, and uh, and we're happy to have it. Uh, another big success has been a project called simply West 7th. And uh, th this developer worked very closely with us. Uh, uh, they asked us what we were looking for. We told them, these, we, they said that's exactly what we want to do. Uh, they've got uh, mildly uh, uh, retail spaces, uh, uh, many restaurants. Uh, it's become a, a very popular destination for, for young adults. Uh, but older folks go there as well. Uh, the housing has been very successful. Uh, rental uh, rates are uh, approximately 96 to 98 percent, which is virtually full occupancy. Uh, it's been very popular uh, and, uh, and, and a big success. Uh, the fourth big project along West 7th Street is called Museum Place. This is across the street uh, from the Modern Art Museum. And, uh, and this was a developer that wanted to do a, a one or two story office building. and. We told him that uh, he was setting his sights too low. He really needed to do something uh, uh, bigger and better than that, and he did, in fact. And, and he's had a great deal of success. So, uh, the bottom image is actually a 7-Eleven store uh, with, uh, with condominiums above it. Uh, and it's a very popular place. People actually enjoy living uh, directly above the store. Uh, so we can have a lot of uh, interesting uses uh, mixed together uh, in a place where people can walk from, from, uh, from one destination to the next. So that's all on, on the West 7th. This is the near south side, Magnolia Village uh, uh, on the south side of Fort Worth. Uh, Magnolia Green is the image on the, on the left side of the screen. It's a, it's a public space where we have uh, a lot of events uh, uh, on the green. Uh, uh, in fact, we have a, a state senator who uh, just, uh, just the other day launched her re-election campaign by holding a big event on the green. That's where people go. This is a, a place that the uh, uh, Folks on that side of Fort Worth recognize as, as, as the place to be for important uh, civic events. Uh, this is a, a, a townhouse project. Uh, we actually had to persuade the developer to consider it. Uh, and the, the uh, developer found that this was the, the, uh, the fastest selling uh, project he'd ever done in Fort Worth. Uh, uh, so much of his surprise, uh, the, the demand uh, well exceeded uh, uh, his expectations. So, and medical offices. Uh, all uh, mixed uh, in, a, in a convenient uh, uh, walkable setting. Uh, this is a view of the street itself. Uh, it's important to, to design our streets uh, for people, uh, consistent with the very theme of this uh, lecture series. Uh, and that requires working closely with our traffic engineers, who tend to design our streets naturally for cars. And so we took a, a, uh, a wide street uh, that had four lanes and converted it uh, basically into two lanes with a center uh, turn lane, uh, adding uh, space for bicycles uh, and for pedestrians and, and on-street parking. It's been a big success. Traffic flows freely uh, and yet we're able to attract a lot more people uh, for, uh, for many other purposes. In fact, uh, every now and then we actually close the streets uh, so that people come just to interact uh, by, by walking along the street. It's, it's, it, it's an event in itself, just to close the street and, and bring people together. And this is the kind of scene that, that we want to create, uh, where, where people are, are, are walking uh, freely uh, from place to place. Sometimes they'll go there just to be there. They're not necessarily uh, interested in, in one destination or another. They, they don't make up their minds where they're going to go have dinner until they get there. That's the kind of place you want to create. A, a place that's a magnet in its own right. I mentioned Bear University Village uh, 
on the edge of the TCU campus. Historically, TCU had actually adopted a policy in campus planning of creating a bubble around uh, their university buildings. And, and they wanted almost to create a wall around the campus and separate the campus from the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, we asked them, and they finally agreed after a meeting with the Board of Trustees, to change that philosophy and embrace the community around them. And they've done that. In fact, and, uh, they've done so uh, with a lot of uh, vigor. And they've uh, worked uh, with the developer to, uh, to uh, develop this uh, uh, mid-rise uh, apartment building for TCU students with uh, retailing at, at street level. Uh, that was done in conjunction with a streetscape project where we turned a street that was uh, very uh, inhospitable for pedestrians. Uh, look at this sidewalk. Uh, and we turned it into something that's a lot more suitable uh, for walking. Uh, years ago, about 40 years ago, uh, the thinking was that uh, people want to drive quickly uh, through the city to get to the mall. And places like Berry Street no longer have a reason uh, to exist. Of course, uh, uh, that kind of thinking was misguided and proved to be uh, uh, faulty. Uh, we've seen businesses coming back to Berry Street as a consequence of this public investment. And the last example I, I want to share with you is, is Polytechnic Wesleyan. Uh, this is uh, on the edge of the, the Texas Wesleyan campus. Uh, and we've seen uh, uh, improvements as, as uh, depicted by the before and after uh, images here. Uh, a, a bookstore, a sandwich shop. Uh, Texas Wesleyan has been a good partner uh, with the city of Fort Worth and with the surrounding community, and that's made a, a big difference. And so even in a, in a lower income neighborhood, uh, this, the principles associated with urban villages uh, can be successful. So let me close uh, by citing uh, what we might consider to be some keys to success. Uh, what is it about the urban village development program that uh, bears promise uh, for uh, mixed-use districts and other communities. Well, first, I think you have to have vision to see things in the future that are different from the way things are today. And it does take visionary thinking, uh, which is not entirely commonplace. You, know, you have to imagine that the, that the future will be different from the, the present. Invariably, it will be, but is it going to be better? And what can we do to, to create that, that better future. So vision, consensus is equally important. You can have a handful of visionaries, but unless they can get the community uh, to adopt uh, their ideas, those, those ideas aren't going to go very far. So building consensus uh, takes time. It takes educational efforts. Uh, it takes a, a, a lot of time to work with folks and answer their questions. Uh, and explain ideas. And I've come to the belief that most uh, intelligent folks, given the right information, will form uh, the right conclusions. Uh, but that takes time uh, to build consensus. Uh, there's no substitute for leadership. Uh, mayor Humphreys is uh, remarking that uh, many cities are one bad mayor away from disaster. That's very true. Uh, in Fort Worth, we've been blessed to have had a, a string of very good mayors who have known how to get things done. And when they get good ideas with community support, they know to move those ideas forward. So leadership is critically important, and, and we've been blessed to, to have had it. Partnerships, the city can't do these things alone. In fact, in most cases, the city's not even in the forefront. We need to provide support. The private sector is going to make uh, these districts successful. The city can either hinder that success uh, or uh, support it. Uh, we want to work in, in partnership with the, with the private sector to support that kind of development uh, and, and make it uh, successful. And finally, a bias for action. Uh, we can spend time studying these issues and finding more and more reasons why these distressed districts aren't working. I think that time can be better spent actually moving forward uh, on actions to, uh, to redevelop those districts into vital uh, mixed-use uh, urban villages. Well, that's our, our story uh, from Fort Worth. I don't know how much time we have. <laughs>